My name is Tamar Friedman. I'm the Director of Peer Programs at Jewish Funders Network. And on behalf of JFN, I'm happy to welcome you to today's webinar, which is a second in a new series hosted by the National Affinity Group on Jewish Poverty and the key success factors in addressing Jewish poverty. In this series, we will highlight specific case studies and bright spots from throughout North America with a particular focus on meeting the enormous challenges posed by the COVID pandemic and its economic effects. Um, in this session, we are lucky to be able to dive deeper into advocacy, which we find to be, of course, a very timely topic. And now I will hand it over to our moderator, Susan Ditkoff of the Bridge Bank Group Boston, who will frame the conversation and introduce today's speakers. Thank you so much, Susan. Thank you, Tamar. Welcome, everyone. Um, my name is Susan Wolf Ditkoff. I'm a senior advisor at the Bridge Band Group, and it's a pleasure to be here um, with Melanie Gorlick and Alana Brightman. Um, I just want to start by acknowledging uh, the historic events of yesterday. Um, many of you may have seen the uh, meme or the photographs that said three Wednesdays at the US Capitol building, um, insurrection, impeachment, inauguration. And it's a pretty extraordinary time, regardless of your political leanings uh, at this moment, it's just unprecedented. Um, so I just wanna start by acknowledging that because today, um, for now, the work that we're doing is all the more important, talking about advocacy, living in community, eliminating poverty, um, and what it is, how, what the role that advocacy can play, um, particularly uh, for those who are disproportionately affected uh, by COVID um, in our community, uh, but, but frankly, for, for, for everyone, because these are obviously not, not new problems, but they're certainly exacerbated. Um, so as we, as we look at a new administration, today is the first day of a full day of a new administration. Um, it really is um, a, an opportune time to talk with our two panelists. Um, Alana is the Senior Vice President um, for Public Affairs at the Jewish Federations for North America. And Melanie is the Senior Vice President um, at the Jewish Council for Public Affairs. So we are excited um, to have both of you. Um, our goal is to really think about the different ways that advocacy can play a, a critical role in addressing poverty. And again, what the role that philanthropy can play as well. So I would just like to start off by asking um, our panelists, if you just wanna to say to us, what, what does advocacy mean to you? Um, so many people have so many different views of advocacy. Um, it would be to just start off by kind of defining some terms. Um, some people think of it as legislative advocacy or policy advocacy. Some think about it in terms of grassroots mobilization and movement building or grass tops, um, building institutional allies, um, awareness building. There are all kinds of different uh, pieces of the puzzle. So maybe if we can just briefly start by like explaining what we mean by advocacy and what we're gonna focus on today in the context of, of poverty. And then what we can do is to, we'll dive in um, to each of your presentations, if that sounds okay. So Alana, would you like to go first? Thank you so much again for having this meeting. It's, it is definitely an opportune time. And as I think about um, the events of the past years, months, days, or weeks, um, depending on how you wanna think about um, our country sort of political standing. You know, obviously a lot of the conversations have been about um, uh, concerns about lack of unity and, and where are we going now in order to resurrect our unity. There's again, lots of different ways to think about it with some really beautiful thinking about, uh, about it by Jewish scholars um, and, and thought leaders from a, a kind of a civic perspective. I also think of very sort of talkless, um, opportunities, which is when we, whoever we are, um, combine to, to work on specific issues that are important to all of us, and frankly, that we share with other communities. There are issues of addressing poverty, which is, you know, critical to, to this conversation, or strengthening the organizations that address poverty, uh, have, have done it for decades, and hopefully <laughs> we'll do it for decades more. I think that that is an amazing starting point, because rather than talking about only the theory of where we go as a country or as a community, we talk about specific things, and, and that usually lends itself to people, you know, putting aside um, their background and really thinking about how do we work together on um, identifying enough food resources 
for people in need or whatever other very practical issue. So I'm excited about this conversation because I do believe it's a really important, important um, one, both in, in, the, in the greater scheme of things, for sure, as we have a new Congress and a new administration, and, um, and then specifically as we move forward. Good. Melanie, do you want to start us off just with how you think about this issue? Um, and then we will start with uh, the PowerPoint presentations, if that's okay. Sure. Um, so, so I agree a lot with uh, what Alana said. Um, the way that I view advocacy is educate, advocate, activate. Um, it's about making change, having a goal, and joining together with others who have a common goal to um, to go from point A to point B. And um, sometimes we work with people um, that we don't have other things in common with, but we want to achieve something. But for the steps for doing advocacy is definitely educate, advocate, activate. We have to make the case. We have to understand why it's important, what changes we need to make. We need to look at our uh, have we connected the dots? Do we know within our own communities where we need to go? And do we have a roadmap to get to our intended goal? And then we work to join with others, to build coalitions, to set goals, to find common ground, and then actually to mobilize. How do we get people out there to speak out, make a difference, um, engage with influencers to achieve our goals? Great, that's a terrific start from both of you. Thank you. Um, so Alana, would you like to start um, with your opening remarks? Thank you. And let me start by sharing my screen, um, which is gonna take me just 10 seconds or so. One second. Ah, there we go. So talking about what I, what I thought might be really interesting for folks is to run through what, what's been happening on the Hill and um, just in the last days of uh, 2020, which of course was signed um, into law by President Trump. And because that's a starting point with what's happening next um, with the Biden administration and the Hill in 2021, um, that I think w helps to inform all of our work. And, you know, I always say the America obviously is a very, um, it's unique in that philanthropy plays a tremendous role in partnering with government, because in so many other countries, including Israel, government has a very significant role in actually providing services. Here, philanthropy plugs in gaps, but also very importantly, um, innovate, so that then government could take it and run with it once philanthropy has tested it out. So I thought it might be really interesting for folks to see some of these issues as they've played out in the past month, because it's going to be important for the work going forward. Um, and um, you know, as a starting point. So this is what I'm gonna to talk to you about. Um, some things around strengthening nonprofits, a little bit on day schools, because I'm not sure who the um, audience is, and so that might be relevant. I'll spend a, a minute on that. And then some direct service grants. So strengthening nonprofits, can you all, I hope that you could see that. Um, I wanna focus on two things, um, which is, so one is the Paycheck Protection Program, which I can't imagine anybody has not heard about. I don't know if people have taken advantage. But as you know, there was a major Paycheck Protection Program draw in um, uh, early in 2020. And just at the end of 2020, there was a second bill, sort of the, the second CARES is the way people think about it, that um, provided for additional Paycheck Protection Program funding um, in, in addition to the first draw. So very, very briefly, the first first time borrowers um, were allowed to, um, uh, oops, this is, apologies, this was meant to be 10 million. Um, there were up to $10 million worth of funding available, some of which could be forgivable, some of which would be loans. Um, and in the second one, it's up to 2 million. It was up to 500 employees. In the second one, it's up to 300 employees. And there's all sorts of additional, of course, um, requirements for receiving and then even getting forgiveness of, of the loans, which um, we can certainly help you with at JFNA. And I'll, I'll give you a website and an email address to go to. But that's one thing I wanted to frame is just the ability for organizations right now to really stay afloat. PPP is an important um, opportunity, and we're happy to be a resource to anybody um, uh, uh, on, on that. So that was 
CPP1 and CPP2. Um, the process is that there um, it goes through the small business administration, so people do want to sign up for any of their alerts. Um, a lot of people have come to us and asked if they had applied in the first um, in the first tranche, should they be asking for forgiveness already? And we've been saying, you don't have to yet. Again, we have FAQs on our website that can give you a lot more detail. Um, and um, more FAQs on the SBA and the Treasury website are coming forward even after, even as, you know, literally daily to provide more guidance. And we're synthesizing them so that nobody's confused so that we can provide that guidance to, to any organization. But very quickly, um, the second big piece has been the employee retention, retention tax credit. This mostly impacts larger organizations because it allows them to essentially write off from taxes some amount of funding per, per eligible employee for eligible employers um, when they have had to close or downsize. So essentially their employees are not really providing a service. And so this tax write-off or this tax credit um, provides yet another financial lifeline to organizations that have had um, an enormous interruption in business. And um, so before, before I, I, and then, sorry, and then the third piece that's really specific to day schools, there was a, there was a fund in the first CARES Act, which was increased by 2.75 billion in the second CARES Act, and the one at the end of the year, which authorized specific funding for non-public schools. A lot of the kind of funding that PPP supports, so you can't double dip, you can't do both. And for any anybody on this call that might be interested in that, the, this is all being done through governors. So for the state in which you're located, the best thing to do is look at your state's government governor emergency relief fund and uh, education fund and um, and see what their process is. It's, State by state, so we, we're not in a position to track 50 different governor emergency education relief funds. But to the extent that you have additional questions about it, you can go to jewishtogether.org slash COVID relief or email SBA loans, which by the way is, is about PPP, is about the taxes, you know, um, all the issues I just mentioned for more information. Additionally, of course, there have been in the last COVID relief fund, um, an omnibus bill at the end of December, there were some increases in funding of the kind that any of you might use for some of your services. So I wanted to go through that. Um, importantly, the Child Care and Development Block Grant um, was a $10 billion in emergency funds for child care providers. Things like, again, sanitation, cleaning, personnel costs, PPE. These are state by state funds. So this is a block grant that goes to different states. And, um, but it could be really helpful to those of you who might have childcare services. And uh, what I would recommend is reaching out to, directly to your state, Department of Social Services and Department of Education to see how those are being administered and what the RFPs will be in that. Um, another major increase uh, in the last bill was 175 million more for emergency senior nutrition uh, so that's for agencies delivering home delivered meals to seniors and waivers for certain eligibility programs, um, as well as um, certain other funding for specific box meals. Again, take a look at what you're, ask your state aging agencies to get more information. And then finally, the last thing I want to mention, and this is all in the sort of, think of as very talkless, this is how you keep dealing with poverty. And this is what government is doing. So where can you take advantage and, and also plug in the hole? Um, for 16 years now, JFNA has been able to uh, get the federal government to fund at-risk security for at-risk nonprofits. And unfortunately, the Jewish community continues to be the most at-risk community, according to law enforcement statistics. We are so excited that this year, the money was doubled from 90 million to 180 million um, nationally. That's not just for the Jewish community, but Jewish community tends to get 60% or, or about there of these funds because of the kinds of risks. You can get information on, and we'll, we can get it around to you guys afterwards, but this is, this is a resource page right here, the JFNA communications, FEBS, et cetera. 
but just as importantly, today at three o'clock, we have a webinar on this. So if anybody is interested, and please feel free to, you know, share it out. Here is um, how you register. I, I could try to put this on the Q&A once we have the conversation as well, because for anybody who just wants to hop on, um, or if, if they can't, if you can't, you can look at the resource page because these will be up there later. And then I'll finally do a shameless plug, uh, and JTPA is a partner with us on this, but we have two things happening at the end of at, in February. The first, February 1st and 2nd, we're doing a virtual national Jewish mission. 2,000 people are coming together already, and hopefully it'll grow to even more, to talk to leadership on both sides of the aisle about um, the, 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 all of these programs the anti-poverty, the anti-Semitism, the security, all these things that we care about as a community. We're coming together across the aisle and across small and large areas, you know, from California to New York and whatever that song was to the Virgin Islands, no, I'm kidding, um, to, to show up uh, as one enormous sort of Jewish communal footprint to talk to leadership in Washington, which I think just goes back to what I was saying before, we're coming together to talk about issues of need, um, but by doing so, we're demonstrating that we're coming back together as a nation. And then the rest of February, Jewish Disability Advocacy Month, where we're partnering with both Jewish and non-Jewish organizations to do that same thing on behalf of the disabilities community, and we'd love for anybody to join. So I'll stop there. Great. Uh, thank you so much. I think that was a, a really powerful set of examples of sort of an organization like JFNA being able to be an intermediary and do a lot of analysis on policy issues that are kind of in front of us right now and really thinking about how to get that information out and benefiting um, as many organizations as possible. So certainly the, the uh, net policy analysis and the information sharing and really connecting people to resources um, as that changes, this is a, this is a really a, a powerful set of concrete examples. Um, so thank you for that. Um, so let's let's sort of let's transition. I know you know Melanie, you have a very different sort of approach, um, but it would be great to hear from you just as you think about partnering, as you think about developing issues, as you think about your three part um, uh, your three part framework. It'd be great to hear um, kind of how you frame these issues. I think you have slides as well. Is that right? Yep, I'm going to try. I just want to apologize to everyone because we are in COVID. And my whole Wi-Fi went out in my building, so I'm in a different location with my earphones on, but hopefully it'll all work out. Um, okay, let's see if this works. Does that work? Okay, so JCPA, we often say that if, if JFNA is, is the head and the brains, JCPA is the heart. And uh, our um, advocacy is specifically um, the, the way we do our advocacy is to build consensus within the Jewish community and then engage with the non-Jewish community in common cause to build a just and pluralistic America. And we grapple with pressing issues of the day. We were created in 1944 when the Jewish community didn't have much influence in the United States um, and where we understood that um, for our own safety and security that we need to be part of the larger uh, American society and uh, sharing our values and building trusted relationships. So it is within that frame that we move forward on poverty um, and addressing poverty. It's been a very, very important issue, a longstanding issue uh, for JCPA. So we address poverty based on our Jewish values. Um, uh, here's a little bit about us. And so we work to build a more just and equitable society for all. We advocate for policies that help lift people out of poverty as we believe that everyone has the right to a basic standard of living. It is vital that the government ensure people have the assistance and support they need to provide and care for themselves and their families. We believe that the Jewish community can only be safe and secure if all communities in America are also safe and secure, and that our actions and engagement help to deter anti-Semitism and build trusted partnerships by sharing our values, actions, and deeds. We come together with other faith communities through our coalitions, especially um, to advocate on poverty and that specific issue. 
We view the budget as a moral document, the federal budget as a moral document, outlining the values and priorities of this country. The federal budget should be a budget that fosters hope, opportunity, and a place at the table for all, especially those experiencing hardships and oppression. Budget priorities are grounded in shared values that together ensure a just foundation in which to grow the economy and to strengthen our country. The COVID pandemic has exasperated poverty in America. Let's get my slide. I just looked up these statistics. Uh, today in 2021, there are 55 million people who live in poverty. Um, 11 million of them are children. Estimates show that over 40% of all children in America live in low-income homes and face economic instability, and up to 16% of Americans experience food insecurity, with numbers of people needing services from food kitchens and other governmental support increasing. More and more people are living paycheck to paycheck, and our unemployment rates have doubled during this period. Um, our shared, under, shared understanding uh, of faith communities is that everyone deserves to have food on the table, to get the medical help they need, and to live in a way that preserves dignity. And we believe that Congress has a moral uh, obligation to effectively fund programs that serve vulnerable populations in times of need. We also know that many churches, synagogues, mosques, and other places of worship work to serve these needs in countless communities around the country, but they can't do the work alone and they are overloaded. Um, funding levels remain far below what they need to be. Food security, which is very important to the Jewish community, something that we care very about, is one of the most acute hardships many Americans, including children, face across the country. And income inequality has exasperated uh, increase this in decades with profound consequences for our society. Here are some of the impact we know of people uh, who lack adequate, lack financial instability and lack of adequate safety net and financial mobility. During COVID, Americans are working harder and harder and more efficiently than ever before. Yet a growing number of middle and low-income families face temporary and permanent poverty due to stagnating wages, failing family incomes and increasing job security. We've also during COVID been exposed to the impact of racial disparities in our country. Black Americans and Hispanics make up the disproportionate percentage of people in poverty. And we have seen that with less act, that they have less access to healthcare and how they're impacted by the pandemic and how hard that has hit the black community. The COVID pandemic has had a profound negative effect on our efforts to combat poverty and further expose and exasperated the significant socioeconomic, gender and racial inequities in our country. Millions are out of work and suffering. I think Alana went beautifully through the, the actual advocacy that uh, we, we work on hand in hand in terms of uh, what we hope the government will do um, on poverty related issues. Um, and we hope that they will that the Biden administration, who's already set a course for recovery, that they will address this crisis and that their measures will actually make a difference. Um, so I'm not going to go through the, the list that Alana did, um, but we do support the minimum wage, assuring access to affordable health care and housing and so forth. Um, and we know that these policies also help the Jewish people as well as the other communities as well. So since its inception, JCPA has been giving meaning, context, and power to the concept of community relations. Community relations is the strategy we use to achieve our network's goal by building relationships with diverse racial, ethnic, and faith leaders, as well as public officials and other nonprofits. Through constant nurturing over the years, we have grown these relationships into powerful partnerships, enabling us to work in common cause and build bridges that bring other communities together. Uh, we know that to do this work, we must educate and engage the Jewish community to be informed and active locally and nationally. Here's some of how we do this. We encourage being present and active with new emerging leaders of advocacy organizations and public officials. There is currently a generational turnover and we need to ensure that the Jewish community and Jewish community leaders know uh, new leaders in all spheres. We encourage JCRCs around the country, those are Jewish community relation councils, um, 
to map out what is happening in the state and local level around issues of poverty, food insecurity, racial disparity for Jewish and non-Jewish people. Who's impacted? What are the policies and regulations in place that need to be changed or tweaked? Do you need a policy change or are, are forms and regulations too cumbersome? It is important that people gain firsthand experience versus getting their news from the internet or TV. Once Jewish people see the impact of poverty and hunger, it often, spur, often spurs them to action. We want to make a difference. We need to know leaders of marginalized community and engage in coalitions working to address local issues. We need to engage in local civic spaces and city councils. With the change in generations that I mentioned, new leaders from diverse communities are emerging and many of them don't know us. They need to know our values and we need to work together to reimagine the communities that we want to live in. This is happening and we want to be part of it. We encourage the Jewish community locally to be part of it. And what about the school to prison pipeline? What are the barriers to advancement? Well, how is education funding in your community, housing, employment opportunities, and does everybody have a fair shake? What are the safety net for low income com communities and is support underway. So we want to ensure that, that we not only are signing and advocating, um, you know, sending more than an action alert, we really want to make sure that we understand what the situation is of our neighbors and ourselves and society and how resources are deployed, what policies are made. And then we encourage that we work together and that we work to make a difference through advocacy, whatever the advocacy strategy is. And um, we have done things like the food stamp challenge that's been very successful where we engage legislator in actually experiencing what it's like to be poor during a period of time by living on a food stamp amount of food. So there's a lot that can be done to make a difference. And we live in that space to help make these issues come alive, bring people to action and so forth. So um, we were founded on the belief that to secure, secure our people's future, that we must actively engage in American public life. We give voice to Jewish values of fairness and justice, and we help to make a better place for everyone, including the Jewish community. Thank you. Good, Nani, thank you so much. There was a lot there to, to bring in, in terms of the values and the motivations um, of why this work is important and how to um, motivate people to, to connect with it. So thank you so much for that and for, for the work. Um, let me just pause by um, inviting folks first and foremost to, um, to chime into the chat if you have questions on the chat, sorry, the kitty. Um, if you have questions, please do bring them into the chat or the Q&A um, and we will read them out and get to them. I want to start by picking up on a thread that I think both of you explored, which is how, what is the role of philanthropy in this work? Um, certainly, you know, with human services work in particular, when people see it, they say, oh, well, you know, isn't funding human services the government's job? Um, funding poverty, funding food, you know, soup kitchens and, and homeless shelters. Uh, so what role can we play? Um, there are so many needs, the needs are so great. So tell us a little bit about how each of you thinks about that and how you sort of convey that to, to philanthropists who are interested in you know, investable opportunities um, to leverage um, what's happening. And I think we saw a couple examples. So Alana, you mentioned sort of how to bring this information to organizations and help them help them leverage it um, for their you know, for their success, which is great. So maybe you could tell us a little bit more about that. And Melanie, you talked a lot about sort of engaging different constituencies, um, certainly constituencies that are historically marginalized, historically oppressed, um, historically silenced. Um, and so just how you think about activating different constituencies and the role that philanthropy can play there, um, that would be great. So let's start to put some things in the Q&A, but Alana, would you like to start and then Melanie? Sure, thank you for that. Um, so, you know, we, we looked at human services this year as, an, as a dire need. Uh, I mean, we're always supportive, obviously, but this year in particular. So that's what JFNA did was taking stock of government funding, also raised funds, a, a human services fund, um, to be able to address what wasn't already addressed by government. As I, as I said before, government is always going to dwarf what any philanthropist can do, right? We're now at the trillion dollar level when we're talking about annual funding and even just COVID relief. That said, 
I think philanthropy plays two major roles. One, it leads the way and innovates and does, you know, a great example is finally there's some funding for telehealth because obviously people couldn't go to their doctors for a variety of reasons, and particularly people in more vulnerable health status. Well, philanthropy has been thinking about that for, for a while. I, I can think of one in New York, because I'm a New Yorker, that did telehealth with Holocaust survivors a good decade ago or so. Um, so it leads the way, and then government can really amplify with its tax dollars. And then the other piece is government can't reach everything. We always know that as well. And whether it is uh, because a particular community sees some things that just um, are not the same need everywhere around the country, so it's very difficult for government to fund it everywhere. You know, maybe it's a particular, it's a rural community, or or maybe it's a particular religious or ethnic community that needs a special kind of um, delivery system in order for it to be okay. So um, we've seen that in the past with kosher meals, where we advocate quite a bit for meals on wheels and, and other programs like that to be kosher or and frankly, halal, which then goes hand in hand. Um, but there are places where sometimes it's not enough and philanthropy needs to come in. Otherwise, we're going to have, you know, our aging seniors who literally can't open a box meal and, and take advantage of it. Um, so I think it's always important. And, and then if I might say one last thing, questions have been raised over time by various writers about um, should, should philanthropists have endowments, is, is this worth our kind of our, our tax havens and that sort of thing? And I would say that, A, it's critical because, again, just the way we work as a country is critical. But B, the more that we, and we're happy to do it at JFNA, can help um, foundation executives, family fund executives, et cetera, understand what is happening, that, con that government context, the more they can make very informed decision about where their dollars have the most value. And we're always happy to do that. Right. No, those are those are great specific examples of just uh, program innovation um, that, you know, leading the way there, thinking about so the telehealth example, advocating for additional funds um, where needed. So those are two really good examples. Thank you. Um, Melanie, talk to us about uh, building and bringing in voices and constituency building. Sure. I also. Um... So a lot of this work is actually based and really needs philanthropy um, dollars and support. Um, we're at a time where there's a huge, as I mentioned, a huge turnover. There's also a huge turnover of Jewish um, uh, community relation directors and staff who um, need to learn and build relationships locally with uh, leaders of other diverse communities. We're also at a time where the Different communities are also at, at, also have new leaders, but also have new issues. Are doing their advocacy different? And all of this um, learning best practices, um, having the education and resources and support to do the work. You know, a lot of it's very quiet, but you don't realize how much goes into it. But there's a lot of thought thought into it, and you need support to really put the materials together to create the advocacy to keep it going to sustain it to bring people together to give people the action steps to to make a difference so um, community relations and and philanthropists have always kind of been partners in community relations and it's a very appreciated and important relationship good those are two great examples as well. Um, so there are a couple of questions in the Q&A. Um, maybe we can pull them in. One is um, from Alan. Um, the Jewish community is politically divided, um, which is reflected in foundations and federation boards. And so how do we think about making a case for engaging in advocacy around poverty specifically in the face of this polarization? And I was sort of add at this, at this moment um, uh, in time. I'd love to address that issue. Um, so the one of the things uh, that I'm most proud of about JCPA, and one reason I even enjoy doing this work, is we represent the wide spectrum of the Jewish community. Um, our 16 national member agencies uh, go from reform to the orthodox, and 
Um, we have diverse people on our national board. JCRCs also have diverse people at their tables. And what we do is we take off our political hat. We take off our Republican, our Democratic hat. And we say, how do we address issues through our Jewish values? Our Jewish values, not only of tikkun olam, but um, uh, uh, you know, made in God's image and justice, justice, and even more than that, how do we ensure the safety and security of people in our community? How are we good neighbors and what do we think is right? And so often when we take off our Jewish hat, our, our boxing gloves, and we sit together to say, how do we address these issues? We end up having much more in common than we, we think we do um, when we're in different spaces. Um, sorry, I was fiddling with my mute button. So thank you, Stephanie. I endorse what Stephanie is saying um, and come back. And so one thing we, we talk about a lot on some of the internally on some of the, the more divisive issue is the radical center. And if we can hold the center, if a little bit of different parts of, you know, the political divide isn't 100% there, it's perhaps the right place to be because, um, you know, in the long run, both as a community and as a country, we tend to, you know, feel more comfortable kind of cut the tide keeps coming back to the center. Um, and that's how we can do our work together. And I know I sound like a broken record, but on issues of, um, of uh, sort of talkless issues, we can continue, you know, to various aspects of our community. And I'll give you again a very concrete example. We did some work this summer uh, through a program called Changemakers where we engage, you know, early 20s. And which is often thought of as, you know, a hyper progressive community, especially on certain issues like Israel. And what we found was it's a community that some of the really appealing issues to that group were fostered because they're very close to their grandparents' generation, so they kind of get, you know, uh, emotionally the tug of, of that senior population. Disability, which, you know, especially when people have someone in their life with a disability and they get it, they get the struggle and they get what's needed. And so it really overcomes this kind of divisiveness or right-left thing when, when you get into those kinds of issues. Good, that's, that's very helpful. And by tachlis, I assume you mean sort of brass tacks kinds of issues. Um, for yeah. People who don't. <laughs> okay, good. Oh, sorry, uh, I, I'm making an assumption and part oh, of it is, yes. yeah. <laughs> of course, of course. Okay, so um, good. So there's one more comment which I wanted to sort of bring in and then I'll, I'll ask one more question. Um, uh, from Houston is saying that she's so glad that these issues are being addressed through a human services lens. Um, she's the CEO of a JFS in Houston and sort of, sort of making the analogy between JFS around the country and JDC, the work that JDC does globally. Um, so, so given that, um, let me ask sort of a, there's, there isn't really a right answer to this question, sort of a hard one. Um, there's a lot of talk in the social justice community right now when we talk about advocacy and poverty um, of sort of the spectrum, it's not either or, but the spectrum between sort of direct service needs um, and sort of the longer term social justice outcome. So for example, there's some you know, pushback on um, safety net sorts of uh, con concerns, not from not from conservative angles, but from um, even progressive angles, saying, "Look, you know, any any money we're spending ameliorating poverty or alleviating poverty is money that we're not spend ending poverty or eradicating it or." ending the conditions um, that make it possible in the first place. So maybe, um, and Melanie, this might be a question for you, but sort of as you think about sort of that balance between, um, again, not either or, but just the balance between meeting direct needs that are so critical in, in, in vulnerable populations right now, and um, sort of the broader conditions, systemic racism, systemic inequities um, that create those conditions. Just talk to us a little bit about how you, how you think about that balance. Well, I think they go hand in hand. I think the how we approach immediate needs and services also um, 
you know, every day we make a decision about, you know, how, what we prioritize, how we approach a concern or an issue, who we serve. And so when we're in a conversation and working hand in hand with those who are impacted and we are listening to them on what their needs are versus deciding on what their needs should be, um, we usually can make a big difference. We also know that right now, uh, you know, really launched by the Black Lives Matter movement in this conversation about how are we resources deployed in our society and are they deployed in a way that actually helps um, underscore and promote you know mental health support with school building skills that make you you know employable or, or be able to get into college or to be able to domestic violence a whole range of social issues you know how are resources deployed you know it's good to be part of that conversation I know that the Federation and human service Jewish human services organizations really care about those issues and really help you know so many in our society beyond the Jewish community there's so much um, where the Jewish community and the community at large can really you know be working together um, and it's our we believe that we just want to ensure everyone's in the conversation and that we are open to it and don't see it um, as othering or other issue um, but that yet you know we're all in this together um, our future is is combined together. And so whatever we can do to make a more just country um, now at this moment, and also as we plan for the future uh, is connected. I hope that answers your question. Good. No, that's no, it. that's very helpful. I think it's, okay. again, it's not an either or, it's just a, a hard thing to balance. Um, I know that's part of the conversation, especially when we talk about representation and who's at the table and whose voices are being heard in the advocacy, in the decision-making about advocacy and resource allocation. So I think that's a very helpful, helpful way to think about it. Yeah, Alana, please. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I, I think that there's also, there's, there are a couple, there's a timing issue and a lane issue. So what I mean by timing is that choice is a little bit of um, what can we do today and what's, what's a long-term issue. And so I agree with Melanie, they don't have to be, uh, it doesn't have to be a choice. It's, it's more of, you know, we can't take our eye off the ball from helping people in the next three months or the next three years, even as long-term change takes decades or centuries and participation. I also think a lot about what is our lane and what is comfortable in keeping our community together and being a good ally to others. Leaving our own in doing so because that's then that's not helpful to, to anyone. And we of being really good allies where it already matches our lane and and where we don't have the knowledge base sometimes not being forward. So as an example, um, when it comes to poverty issues and COVID response issues, which have you know lots of Information has come out certainly about um, how uh, communities of color and communities of poverty really ha have suffered in very disproportionate ways. That's our lane already. We're already doing the work of the human services as the health services and what have you. And that's where we can be our best, the best ally to anybody ourselves and, and beyond. Um, when it comes to um, some other issues, I think that we've had to just look at, you know, are we helpful or are we not? So in the wake of Floyd, uh, of George Floyd's death, um, we put out a significant statement. A lot of the community had redoubled. It wasn't the first time they, they made their um, effort to, to really be in relationship with those communities and see where we can help. Um, but not every um, part of, of another community's agenda was as comfortable for everybody. Right, so, so trying to be a good ally where it seemed like we had something to add. Um, and so as an example of that, um, there's been a lot of talk about obviously police reform, defund the police or police reform or you know, different gradations of that, which obviously becomes tricky. So one of the, the things that we had done because we had worked so much on nonprofit security and I, I think hands down we're the most knowledgeable community about it is we, contacted um, other organizations that represent really other communities and offer to brief and have helped one briefing and are working on another. Because while we may not all agree on the police reform issues as they've been articulated, we can all get 
get behind sharing our knowledge to make other communities more secure than they are today. So, you know, just trying to find the sweet spot where we can actually be helpful. It's a great example of a place where there's certainly a role for organizations um, that do need to have sort of a big tent and represent a lot of diverse voices, um, but also the role that advocacy, true sort of like issue advocacy organizations can play to sort of push the boundaries of, of where the debate is um, what, on whatever issue it may be. And those are sort of different kinds of uh, those are good, good examples of different kinds of advocacy strategies. I mean, it's interesting, um, we have about 12 minutes left. So if there are any last questions, um, please do put them uh, in the Q&A. Um, but just one, one observation is that, you know, a couple of years ago, um, I wrote an article with a colleague um, for the Stanford Social Innovation Review about philanthropy and advocacy. And at the time, this is 2018 or so, um, at the time there was, you know, there were a lot of uh, philanthropically, um, political activists um, were still the exception, um, not the rule. And there were a lot of people who said, look, we want to stay above the fray. We, um, even on issues we care about and you know, the, the tectonic shifts feel very threatening. And you know, a lot of, especially a lot of families and individuals say, look, I don't want to, I, we don't do advocacy. That was sort of the, the common refrain and our board members don't you know, want us to get political um, and we're afraid of our, losing our charitable status. And there were kind of a whole, a whole series of of, um, of reasons why all of which you know, ma made sense. Um, and obviously, you know, it's a pretty withering debate. Um, it's a withering uh, arena if, if you kind of play in, depending on which one, which arena you play in. But at the same time, you know, it's certainly true that there's um, some philanthropists who have been sort of expanding the definition of advocacy and what they, what it is that they can do. Um, and there is a sort of a whole range. One of the one of the most surprising things that we found was how few philanthropists kind of knew the rules of the game, um, knew what they could do um, without without violating you know, their charitable status. So things like conducting research um, that informs, you know, shaping the debate or developing model policies and administrative rules, um, you know, kind of after, after the big piece of policy, um, the legislation gets passed, there's all of the regulatory and administrative work. Um, there's litigation, there's uh, coalition building. Um, Melanie, you were talking about that. They're you know, developing um, a lot of the different sort of building blocks of, of, the, of the debate that kind of can help frame it, which, which still feel a little bit more comfortable for some folks um, and don't feel quite as, as threatening as some of the kind of the, the brawl, you know, kind of the, the gloves off brawling. Um, but there is so much um, that philanthropists can do just to sort of move the, move the debate and move the goalposts even of the debate um, before it even gets to a political arena. So I think both of you gave us some really good examples um, of that. So, so thank you, thank you for that. Um, uh, in a minute, we're going to turn to some closing comments. Um, but first, I just want to ask you a question about um, about coalition building. Um, as you think about the kinds of um, messaging and awareness building, so much of awareness building and and messaging can be really focused on singing to the choir um, and singing to the people who already agree, um, and you know, they don't necessarily. It's not necessarily designed to win new out. Right, it's it's designed to um, excite the base, and that's that's certainly one strategy. But certainly, when we're thinking about sort of broader coalitions, and you think about what is language that will, or or awareness building strategies or messages that will expand. Um, kind of who we can bring in that winnable middle. Um, I would love to just sort of hear a little bit about how you think about just the, the messaging piece um, of, of the coalition building because messaging, just as you said, Alana, it's just so tricky um, when you get into trying to kind of keep a coalition or you know, even, even one organization uh, together. Um, but talk to us a little bit about awareness building and, and messaging. I could start by saying that we are, um, <laughs> messaging as much time as substance because we are a very, very broad tent with the Federation movement. And so we try to really assiduously think about how might this be read by somebody else? Because it's a shame if the message turns somebody off from the substance. It's really usually when the substance, people can work together across all kinds of lines. Um, so we try to really think think about not just copying and pasting somebody's message when we're just trying to move fast, thinking about what would this look like if you read it out of context. 
Um, and what is what is the what is a way to address something even when you disagree with it and um, really give it full um, respect in the way that it's written about? And kind of one of my tricks of the trade, I, I guess, is especially in, in discussing political uh, issues, is to try to to uh, keep to process and facts, you know, and like just and not characterize them as much as possible. People will bring their own characterization to it, but to the extent that you don't take them off track, um, I think it just helps you get in, in in the conversation and not not leave them at the door. Good. That's helpful. Melanie, are you? Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah. Hi. Yeah, uh, that's a really good question. So, so much of our work is done in coalition. Um, we both uh, support Jewish coalitions. We are the one place in the Jewish world where we bring together our 16 national agencies, uh, JCRCs to really build consensus and grapple with, in, with issues and then what we're going to support and what our wording and boundaries are on those issues. You know, We also very much take into consideration the people who will be impacted um, or are speaking out by whatever that policy may be. Um, so we really do have a strong process and put that and then we engage in coalitions. And one of the things that we're always grappling with is, you know, how do we build relationships within those coalitions that unite us? How do we deal with the issues when we disagree? Or even when it becomes controversial, how do we ensure that we can have agreement within the co with the group to stay on the focus of achieving our goals and let you know other issues? Uh, some people call them third rail issues. We're in a number of coalitions where they're national coalitions where they're third rail issues, so we don't um, have them seep into. Uh, uh, making anyone uncomfortable. Everyone should be comfortable and welcome and, and a valued player on a coalition. Um, and then, as I said before, it's really important to us because we are not um, receiving governmental dollars um, and we are also not um, ourselves direct service providers. We want to ensure that we're educating the Jewish community to be aware of the issues and impact and uh, situations that are happening in the United States so that when they can be active locally for making a change so they could be the really smart and prepared at any table that they sit in um, and that we can move people into a Jewish lens, a Jewish value based lens on dealing with complicated issues versus um, staying in the, the, the polarized lens. Um, we think that's really very important. And, um, and so that's a lot of the work we do. So we think messaging is extremely important. Right. And, you know, that is just a place where philanthropy really can lean in, in terms of developing messaging, focus groups, um, even thinking, I mean, just sort of rewinding the clock and sort of saying, well, the, the notion of a death tax really sort of galvanized a whole set of, to really change the frame of a debate. Um, there's so many examples like that where um, we're really changing those frames um, can, can break through in a way that all the all the pamphlets in the world won't do so. Um, these are these are great examples. Plus, um, people don't read anymore. <laughs> you can put everything <laughs> right. into three bullet points. That's it. Right. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So we're coming to the end of our time. Um, I just wanted to give each of you a moment to kind of reflect on on this conversation, on this moment um, at the federal level, but also kind of at sort of the, the trickle down um, and the ripple effects um, nationally as we sort of enter 2021. There's there is a vaccine. Um, the even the rollout of the vaccine has been disproportionate, um, and certainly the recoveries, recovery, plural um, recoveries are going to be disproportionate as well. But talk to us a little bit uh, um, as you kind of as we as we end about sort of your look at what's what's in your mind um, and what's what's resonating for you from this conversation. Um, what do institutions need in order to serve community uh, and beyond as well, because again, in our system, let's say the hospital or the nursing homes or, you know, the Jewish, um, the JFSs, um, they're, they're serving anybody who comes to the door with an enormous percentage of people who are not Jewish, for example, in the hospital, staff. Um, how do they maintain their ability to get everybody 
know, it's an unprecedented challenge. And I'm not even talking politics, I'm really talking the pandemic. Good, thank you. Melanie? Alana went in and out for me a little bit. So if I apologize at all, I'm, I'm sorry. Um, I mean, if I repeat anything. Um, so there's a lot um, to say. I think that it's really important to support all, all parts of the Jewish community um, because it's time that we work hand in hand um, in, um, in getting through this COVID period and then restoring the country on its feet and also to be dealing with the myriad of issues that are before us right now from racial disparities, you know, um, economics to our own community to senior. So many of the Jewish community are, are entering into the senior uh, population. There's just, you know, we have so many uh, young people who are interested in policy in the country that they, they want to live in and they care about Israel or have questions about it. There's so much to do. And I think um, it's important that we all work together. Um, and, um, and again, this is a moment, it's, it's almost as if for JCPA, we're back at our original mission, as if we needed to be recreated for exactly what our mission is today. And that is to, um, to deter anti-Semitism, hate bigotry, racism, build a just and pluralistic country, um, decrease polarization, have a common table where different perspectives can come and just wrestle it out on different perspectives and, and really come together around Jewish values and a Jewish um, lens on the country that we want to live. So it's a very um, vibrant moment. I think COVID has really you know, engaged people, concerned people, and um, yet resources are really need for, needed for a number of Jewish organizations, and especially um, for organizations doing community relations and outreach, because it's, it's a new day, but the same methodology is still in play. Good. Well, I just want to take this opportunity, we're right at the top of the hour, I want to take this opportunity to thank both of you. Um, this has really been a, a wide ranging conversation, um, very detail oriented, lots of big picture ideas, and also just some very practical suggestions for what, what philanthropists can do. Um, and so thank you, thank you. Let me turn it back to Tamar to, to you. Wonderful, thank you so much, Melanie, Alana, and Susan for this, um, for this really interesting um, presentation really interesting webinar. Like Susan said, there's so much that was discussed and to, di to digest here. If anybody has any questions, you can reach out to me and I can help you get connected with the presenters if you have any follow-up questions or wanted to learn more about either one of their, their works or the organizations that they, that they serve at. Um, and uh, I hope all of you will also join us again in two weeks when we continue this series. Thank you all, have a good day. <laughs>